Hello and welcome everybody. This is the third in our series of lunchtime sessions during the We Accelerate Week. My name is Ruven. I'm a co-founder and managing partner at The Do, and I'm thrilled to guide you and us through this lunchtime session ahead of us. As you probably know already, We Accelerate is all about sharing what worked over the pandemic, talking about the changes and solutions that we saw driving positive change and where we all feel they now need to be accelerated to create even greater impact. Today's session is called Skills and Mindsets for the Future of Work. And we've seen that the pandemic has greatly extended uh, what we could, what is considered a crucial shift in skills and mindsets that are needed to be successful at work and in life. I remember last year already during the We Emerge Week, we talked about this fact that uh, a study had shown 50% of professionals will need to upskill by 2025. But which of these skills are most important? And how do we shift habits and mindsets in teams? We want to take the opportunity today and the next 40 minutes to explore what has worked, what needs to be accelerated, and we're very excited to be joined in the session later on by two leaders to speak about their experiences of, from the last year. On the one hand, Anna Kopp, the CIO and regional office lead for Munich HQ for Microsoft, and Ricky Wong, managing director of Wheelock Properties. But before we do that, it's my huge pleasure to say hello and welcome, especially welcome here in person to Catherine, Kirschenmann, founder and CEO of the Do, who over uh, in her function as leader of the Do School, has spent a lot of time with our partners over the last year, supporting them, helping them in the shift, helping them transition their teams, working on skills and mindsets. So Catherine, given today's topic, let's start with a really simple question. Future of work, what is it and when is it going to be here? <laughs> Great starting point. Future of work, is it already here? Um, I think actually partially yes, uh, but obviously we'll also still see considerable amounts of change in the coming years. So why, why do I say that? And, and what do I actually mean by future of work from my perspective? I think it really comprises two major aspects. So the one thing that we're talking about in the future of work is really what is the future of jobs and occupations. So which occupations will we need most and what related skills are needed? Where do we need to train more? What will be most relevant? What maybe is in decline? So really looking longer term into these like big also economy wide moves. And obviously uh, the impact of technology is huge there. Um, certain jobs are getting replaced and so on. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, what COVID did there obviously. And then also uh, the second part of the future of the work for me is the future of how we work. So this is really about how we come together as teams, how we collaborate and also very practical things of where do we actually work uh, and then how does that fit together. And, and both aspects obviously are super related to skills and mindsets uh, because depending on how that develops, they need to change or accelerate. Um, and, and obviously COVID had a tremendous impact. So on both aspects, uh, giving just a brief look on the future of job side, I think uh, obviously there was a huge shift within a couple of months. Some people said the COVID basically drove like 10 years of digitization in two, three months time. And that also applies to jobs. A lot of the services actually have shifted online, first and foremost, e-commerce, but also telehealth or online banking, like all these services have picked up tremendously. And the people doing jobs before that were happening in person, one-on-one, -on -one, are now doing them remote or are replaced by, uh, by bots, for example. And we need people that manage those or troubleshoot, right? And so overnight, there was a huge shift in skills that were needed. And then also, uh, obviously, when we talk about the future of work in the sense of how we work, uh, I think we've all experienced it. All of a sudden, we're a lot more remote. We're now a lot more hybrid. I think most organizations have 
shifted from like a full remote back into some form of hybrid work um, and that will stay uh, i think that's something that that will keep seeing um, and there's one more topic I quickly want to bring in because I think we can't ignore it. And it's, it's such a big one that was now accelerated by COVID is what's now known as the great resignation or also the, the great quit, some people say, um, which basically is a summary saying in the past month since April, actually this year out in the US alone, over 20 million people have left their jobs willingly. And uh, some studies like the Microsoft study for the work trend index, they, for example, found that globally around 40% of the workforce is considering to leave their jobs still within 2021. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean that all of them will, but it is something that employers uh, really need to be very aware of. And we need to talk about what that means in terms of changes uh, in, in the workforce, essentially. Super exciting. So really, future of work, what is it? What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And even why are we even doing it? Uh, so really exciting stuff. I know we'll hear in a, in a couple of minutes from, uh, from Anna and Ricky, but before that, uh, uh, and, and I'll make more room on, this, uh, on the stage for you for that, but can you talk a little bit more from, from your experience? How have what have you seen work within organizations for leaders, for individuals in terms of reacting to these changes that you just described? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and obviously a lot has happened with all our partners that we've worked with uh, to all the different aspects I just mentioned over the last year and a half. So um, let me start with talking about organizational level and, and reaction to what I've just shared around the future of work and impacts of COVID. So I think the first one that's really important for me to talk about is purpose. Uh, two things here. Uh, on the one side, purpose already came to some fame, I wanna say before COVID, but mostly in a sense of, oh, let's create a purpose and let's talk about it. And it hasn't really been brought to fruition because uh, it was often seen more as a communication exercise. And, and I think here now we have a significant opportunity because when I bring it back to related back to the great resignation I just talked about, when we look at the underlying reasons, they span, uh, obviously there's a multitude of reasons, but actually they span from just plain burnout uh, because of the stress of the last 18 months and before, uh, but they also, a significant part that's coming up in the research now is that people lack the meaning and they're really reassessing the meaning of their lives coming out of this pandemic and they lack the meaning in the jobs that they're doing. And here, obviously, purpose is one of the key factors that organizations can leverage, but it has really to be done right. So to understand a purpose is not about communication exercise, but it is really about aligning with everybody, engaging people, giving an opportunity or mechanisms where people can really come in and live that out and really have those deep conversations as well, because it's not a one way street, obviously. Um, and then lastly, the recommendation and what we've learned and seen work is also to, to integrate whatever um, purpose uh, is worked out into the strategy on the one side, and then also into all the key processes along the employee experience so that it really gets a coherent experience that's talked about regularly. And that's not just a nice uh, sticker or um, screen share, basically. So purpose, one major thing that we need to talk about and that has worked and will work uh, in the future of work for organizations. The second, what I quickly want to talk about, second part is uh, for a long time, and that was also, again, something that happened already pre-COVID, but it has been accelerated now more and more, is HR and strategy have not been aligned well enough. And what that means and what happens then is that most companies are currently transforming. Most companies are currently going through some kind of change process, whether that's uh, to do with sustainability and carbon reduction, whether that's to do with uh, digitization. Uh, 
or other influencers, but most companies are undergoing change and that will be ongoing. So what HR and strategy really need to do is to break through the silos of creating training resources that are not related to the strategy changes, because that obviously leads to misalignment. And also for the company, it leads to uh, lacking out on, on results, actually. So one example I want to give here is with one of our partners uh, one and a half years ago, actually, or a little longer, even quickly, uh, yeah, briefly before COVID, we started to work on uh, exactly that question. How can we really bring together the transformation agenda with leadership development? And uh, the first step, obviously, is really to create a team that spans across as simple as that, like breaking down silos by getting people from both perspectives into the room as a co-creation team that really together aligns on the goals of what needs to get done. And then uh, we designed and are running a program that really uh, in, brings in all the influences from strategy and transformation. And that can be through representation from board members in the program. That can be through the topics or business challenges that are brought into the program um, and other ways of interaction, but to really have this very close alignment and the results that are created in the program directly are being picked up from uh, you know heads of countries and so on so also for the participants this shows that what they're doing and along the way they're obviously learning a lot but they whilst they're doing that they see that it's actually valued and it's aligned with what's expected and they can see their growth so this is one example uh, and from my perspective, a really crucial one for every company, every organization to think about how to better align training, development, mindset change with the big picture strategic transformation. And then uh, the last bit I want to share for organizations, what we've seen work or actually not work uh, in a lot of times and, and hence is so important to point out to is there needs to be a change in narrative around the future of work. What I see happen a lot is that there is a lot of fear created around the future of work. So a lot of companies internally talk about things like, oh, this job won't exist anymore in five years. And we're training trainees in occupations that we already know they will never start working in. And yes, that's a reality. But if you tell people that, if you tell people, hey, you know what? You got to learn something new because your job, you will be obsolete in a couple of years that instills fear. And uh, we all know by now from, from research and from cognitive science that fear never actually leads to action. Fear leads to brains shutting down, getting in fight or flight mode, not being able to actually be creative, not being able to react, and actually we're creating the opposite of what we're intending to do. With one of our partners in the retail industry, which is obviously one where a lot of change will happen, also when we talk about occupation and, and how uh, e-commerce is impacting, for example, all of that, we we therefore, you know, sat together and really uh, created a campaign. Um, so communication narrative that's around positive emotions, incentives, and intrinsic motivation. But then also not only campaign, but also activation mechanisms that make it super easy for people to participate in a game fight approach and to really get into the topic without actually talking about the topic itself so much um, and really getting the fear out of the picture completely and rather making it something desirable um, for a joint future. And that, by the way, also leads us back to the purpose uh, topic because this joint future should and can be rooted in purpose, but for purpose and also for, for activation, it's really important that you, again, don't just think about the story and the words and how that's going to translate into nice images, but really what are the mechanisms that people can get active? What are the ways that people can participate and create something by themselves? And then only that way you will be able to change uh, a skills, but also mindsets, because mindsets are not changed through theory. They're actually changed 
through experience and experiencing something one or even better multiple times will have that significant impact. So you need to think about those mechanisms of creating experience and opportunity for experience. So that's on the organizational level. Um, within organizations, obviously, there is a crucial part uh, of, of responsibility on leadership and on managers. So I quickly want to talk about that group as well. Um, and, and one thing, uh, and again, I want to point to three things that we're seeing as becoming more and more relevant and also work. So uh, the first one is actually something, and again, I think this is, is a common thread you can see is something that actually was already really relevant pre-COVID, but through the impacts of COVID just accelerated and through the changes of, for example, a lot more uh, remote work and so on. I think the, the first thing I really want to point out is that leaders and managers need to lead by trust, not by fear. This is partially coming back to the, the story around that fear is not really doing anything anyways, but also because trust is essential in times of change, because only if you can build a team and a, a base of people that trust each other, you will be able to go through that change together. You'll be able to, um, you know, approach it productively and see it as an opportunity actually rather than a, a threat or a challenge and I think in that sense trust is the one key and, and there's concrete skills around trust uh, that, that can be learned and it can be enhanced but of course it's also a matter of mindset of how somebody thinks they can create uh, change with their teams and, and it also it obviously takes effort so it's not something that that you can just do overnight. It, it really it takes the dedication, takes the effort, building certain structures, routines, and rituals with your team to really build up that trust. But first and foremost, it takes a leader that really believes and takes the effort in, um, in upskilling and how to do that and then actually implementing it. The second part I want to talk about is that I think there are two major I want to say hard skills that uh, that people in organizations that have decision power in organizations need to beef up on. Um, and one of that is the is what I would subsume as digital lit literacy. And then the second one is sustainability. So why those? Uh, digital literacy, I think that's quite an obvious one, uh, looking at what happened in the past months, but I, I also very specifically within digital literacy mean collaboration tools. Uh, and because this is one way of how remote and how hybrid will actually be possible. And using those tools, and actually that also relates back to trust, because uh, there is the, the hard skill around being able to use those tools, being able to really harness their, um, their features. And then uh, the trust comes into play when it's about really bringing them to life and building a base for teams to co-create and to collaborate and to be creative in that context as well. Um, and then sustainability skills I mentioned, uh, I think this is one that uh, is really important to recognize is that almost all com companies have now more than ever before understood and committed to a very strict sustainability agenda to transformation towards carbon neutral or other aspects. And they're really serious about those goals but actually the research shows that there's a sincere lack of knowledge around how to actually get there, um, what really needs to get done. Um, and so I think here is a tremendous need for upskilling. Um, and we're doing this with, with actually with two of our partners right now is to um, and take a, a larger amount of people through courses on climate action in that case and to really give them uh, not only the skills and the mindsets and the tools to become active, but also by offering such a course, um, the company actually communicates a mandate and they say they communicate and tell their people like, look, we're offering you this because we want you to get active and you have our mandate uh, and it's our wish that you do that. 
And again, obviously, it also aligns back to purpose. It can align with or, or go back to the question of do I find meaning at work? And do I get the mandate to act based on, on the meaning uh, that, that's important for me? So I think that that's uh, three of the bits uh, that, that I would want to share with uh, as most relevant for leaders from our experience. And then uh, last but not least, obviously, there's also individuals. And actually here, I, I want to talk least uh, because I think this is something that comes down to very personal um, reflection on, on and, and that is happening, obviously, when we talk about the great resignation. I think uh, I, I just want to share two quick things here. So I think first and foremost, what I would say for individuals is really be kind with yourself at this stage and acknowledge what has happened in the last 18 months. I think a lot of people just powered through because we had to, right? Uh, schools shut down overnight. Uh, jobs changed overnight. Uh, maybe parents got sick, or at least we got really worried that somebody in the family or friends would. And actually also obviously a lot of people lost dear ones. So I think there are so many factors uh, and, and obviously depending on the economic situation, those influences were, were even harder for some than for others. But I think every single one of us, no matter where we live and how we live, we had a severe impact. And I think it's time to acknowledge that and to take a breather and to understand what actually happened and what that means for us right now. Um, and I think it's also really important if you haven't done that yet to really think about going forward, what's a healthy practice for you, um, structuring your work day, uh, looking into maybe remote or hybrid, or even if you're back in the office full time, how can you create healthy habits, healthy practices to support you uh, to stabilize and basically go forward with a healthy mind and healthy body? Um, and then the second piece uh, I, I have to say is also we need to acknowledge every one of us that the change is not going to stop. Right. So in the very beginning, when Ruben asked whether future of work is already here, I said partially yes, but obviously more is to come uh, because already pre-COVID, we were talking about the massive changes, the massive needs to change in skills and occupations over the next years. And that has now intensified, but it also means that there's still a lot more to come. And I think it really helps to acknowledge that change is a constant. And the one mindset that is obviously one that is needed here is, uh, is a growth mindset, which can be practiced. Um, so I can only really recommend to find ways of how you can practice to build your growth mindset and, and to acknowledge and also embrace to a certain extent that this change will continue, uh, but it doesn't have to happen to you, you can be part of shaping that change uh, and, and realizing that power that, that it actually can give you. So I'll stop here. There's obviously a lot more to talk about, but I also had an opportunity to sit down with Anna Kopp, um, who is leading a team at Microsoft. And she actually shared with me also some super concrete examples of what all of that actually meant for Microsoft how they went through it, what they learned from it. And um, I'm super excited uh, to, to have that conversation now. So wonderful to have you, Anna. Um, you have so much experience with the future of work, which some could argue is already here, um, working with your teams at Microsoft. And I'm just super curious to hear from you what are some of the biggest impacts that COVID-19 has had on Microsoft and your work realities? Yeah, thank you for having me. Really looking forward to the conversation. Um, our CEO, the so global CEO, Satya Nadella, said uh, already last spring, we have experienced two years of, of digitalization in two months um, at the time. And, and he was really right there. The interesting thing for us in our work uh, um, uh, environment and, and reality was there wasn't much change at all because we already started working flexibly and working from home uh, 2014. So with a bit, you know, 
a bit more heavier on the home office for for a full week for quite some months it it was difficult sometimes but we had the equipment we had the tools we had everything we needed so for us that transition wasn't so bad and we worked a lot more on on the culture around working flexibly because you know, you have to act differently when you're always on the video camera right um and most importantly building those stories for us to be able to to speak to customers because customers pinged us and said help us but don't talk about your products talk about how you work how, how what's your culture how do you how do you do this um and that was a big shift towards the cultural side uh more than the the technology side that is so interesting and and can you share a bit in terms of culture what what did you do or what do you also think others need to do to create a culture because the reality is we will all stay in a lot more remote hybrid world uh, when it comes to services but also to our ways of working well internally the the most important thing is trust um and i'll tell you a little story here 2013 we um we established a workplace of trust and workplace uh, work time of trust so work from anywhere when you want to when it fits in your life um, we worked with our works council we had agreements they were all signed and everything and we told our employees now you can work anytime you like you know at your hours where you want to um we rolled that out like here you go feel free and what happened nothing because and as a, we didn't do we didn't realize that people are not just going to feel all oh, right i can work from home and, and you know you have to build trust uh, between manager and teams you have to establish that and you have to do change management taking the specifically the middle management by the hand and showing them how do you now manage a team remotely so we had to take a step back then and so quite a few years ago 2013 2014 um do the change management and have workshops with the managers and how to trust and then it takes time um and the the key thing we usually talk about that needs to happen is the conversation between manager and employee needs to move from attendance culture like are you punctual you know nine o'clock in the office um or at your pc to uh what is it that you're working on so quality instead of quantity and this means changing the incentive system we worked for for a couple of years to move the bonus system um and the conversations that you have with your, your performance reviews and, and all of that shifting that to the 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 what and the how rather than just you know when and where uh, and that's really important because if you if you have trust and you have a clear conversation this is this is expectations from my company from me as a manager and then your expectations for me to lead you where do you need help but also what do you want to deliver what do you want to do this week this month this quarter um with your customer with your marketing campaign with your it rollout uh, and always checking are you on track when you're when you're talking about what it is you're doing um and you have that very clear picture this is this is what i'm delivering then it doesn't matter if you're punctual at your desk in the morning you know because things that you do what you're supposed to be doing and you're talking about that and that's between you know um manager and an employee so do you remember these old times when people say do you have a part-time job when you left the office like quarter to five because you know and you try to sneak out yes. so no one saw you. you you want to go to sports or whatever uh and you always yeah yeah because i need to you know you have this excuse now you just go bam i'm out and no one says anything because it's none of their business. But at the end of the week, when you you know you talk to your manager or what, per month or whatever, and you talk about, so how did it go? Did you land the campaign? Did you go out in time? Did you win the deal? Uh, did you make the customer happy? And whatever it is you're measured upon, if that happened, who cares when and, and where you did it? You know, it happened. The results are there. And that's a super cool example and you were talking about trust as as one really important factor here are there other new or skills or mindsets that are either new or more important now than maybe before so what helps people thrive in this new reality and that could be leadership level or also um, the team level is there anything that that you've realized or seen two things two very clear things um and you kind of mentioned it mindset so growth mindset 
you have to have a um, a good culture of making mistakes because you will do and you need to make your mistakes and then rise and shake off and, and continue and learn from them. So uh, to enable your people to try out new things and be innovative and specifically when you're you're not meeting and monitoring them in the office to have them be self-sufficient you need to enable them and trust them and then things are going to go wrong and then you go all right then let's fix it together and we learn something really important um so that's number one and then number two i just said the word learning um we are in a mode of perpetual learning nowadays um skilling and learning becomes more and more important uh we no longer take a course how to use the tool we do that you know five days uh, and then you work with it for 20 years because it was rolled out and implemented now that's you know click here it does that we have agile development of of tools which means that every two weeks there's a new functionality that i need to quickly grasp and understand and implement in my daily work but uh also other things it's, it keeps being you know, that learning new things and, and keeping on track of technology and new standards. You know, you know it, every six months, there's there's something new that is a new standard that you need to you know be on top of to be able to service your customers really well. So learning and skilling uh, and certifications. And when I speak to customers and they I say, you need to invest in your em employees in learning and skilling. And a new talent asks, what can I learn with your company? Not what company car am I gonna get? They wanna see, what can what can I bring to my career ladder, which is skills and, and knowledges and certifications. So this is what's what's really asked from from employees and new talent. Very important thing to win them, um, and and that is where the customers go. Yeah, but that's expensive. And I say, yeah, <laughs> and and you need you need to budget for it. Um, and plan for it. And one cool thing nowadays with um, digitalization, just to tie the knot on that one, is there used to be a time you had a trainer, a classroom, everyone, you needed to get everyone together. Um, and that cost a lot of money and you needed to, you know, you, you, you pulled everyone out of their working environment. And now you can do it, you can record, um, you can do video on demand, you can do self-paced training. So invest more in those kind of snippets and small videos that are easy to consume you know, Friday morning coffee, you know, learning session of five minutes of something new um, at your own pace when you have time. So you don't have to pull your people out for a very long time, travel there and they, you know, you need lunches and you need hotel rooms and all kinds of things. Um, and yeah, reducing travel also kind of good for the environment, sustainability as we know today. So that's that's a win-win. Absolutely. And it's really cool to hear about new approaches to learning and how you can customize them a lot more for your own demand and needs and pace. And are there any other ways that you've experienced beyond sort of the training that you have maybe used or seen other use to help people acquire these new skills and mindsets? Um, I think an open mindset, so being being very transparent about things, uh, which also really goes just to handle your your workday, um, is you know having conversations about things. When something goes wrong, talk about it, even in the group. And uh, there's so called up sessions. <laughs> Many companies do them. Oh, that really went super wrong. Let me tell you all about it, and then let's discuss what could I have done differently. Where could I have asked someone for help? Asking for help is, is something that needs to be a cool thing to do and not something that is a weakness. Um, and then the managers, I think that that's a key thing, you know, managing uh, the, the level of information that we are having today. We get so much information that we have we have moved to role based training. So instead of just easily blasting everyone here, you have to everyone has to take this training. I'll give you an example when we didn't do it uh, this year and we realized, oops, we did it again. Uh, we thought, let's do a one and a half hour training with the end to end process. So it was a certain sales process. And there were different roles for like five to 10 minutes for each. And then you hand over to the next one and so on. Um, and that, you know, having a full team sit through 90 minutes where theoretically they were just, um, it was relevant for them, the handoff from the, the, the step before my step the next step taking over and handing off so if we've done this just cleverly taking 
step one plus two uh, plus three two plus three plus four do you get what i'm saying you know so that so that you get the before and after and and your role in this and then just a very short summary training five minutes here's the full process this person goes there hands up to this person then they do you know the approval here then it take goes over to create a proposal whatever it takes a bit more brain to develop those script boards but that really pays off because you're saving hundreds of hours of time with people sitting through trainings that are not relevant for them thank you so much for these examples and insights really great to have heard what's worked for you especially also considering how long you've been already in this uh, game of you know working remote working hybrid using a lot of technology obviously and uh, as as many of us are or had to adapt uh, quite rapidly in in those first months of the pandemic i think it's super helpful to also see what you know what you can learn how you can do it long term because as you said i, I totally agree this is something will continue and will need to continue to learn and get better and uh, really fully embrace this also in terms of mindset. So thanks a lot for sharing all of this. Thanks for having me from thanks for the great conversation. Really nice to hear from Anna. I, I really enjoyed her examples, but but I have to admit, I, I also really enjoyed uh, at the end the story that she shared, uh, sort of the reminder that you really have to keep at it uh, and how easy it is to fall back into old habits and you have to catch yourself and uh, and keep learning uh, and keep improving so i think uh, very uh, encouraging for me to to hear her speak about that as well uh, and uh, to take take a nudge away from myself and for all of us to keep sort of like questioning whether we're not falling back into into old habits sometimes uh, even knowing that we need to change um, but now, before we return to some concluding thoughts with Catherine, let's, uh, let's hear a very different perspective. Uh, and I'm super excited that we get to go around the world uh, uh, from, from Munich all the way to Hong Kong, where Belinda, the managing director of the Do Asia, had a chance to sit down with Ricky Wong and get his views on the skills and mindsets needed for the future of work. Let's take a look. Welcome everyone. My name is Belinda Esterhammer and I'm the Managing Director Asia of The Duo. Together, I'm here today with Wiki Wong, Managing Director of Wheelock Properties Limited. A lot of things have happened in the past few years, whether it's the way we work or how we interact with each other in the workplace. Business as usual is over. Companies all around the world are confronted with challenges both practical and existential. And while some of them have failed, many have just survived. In the midst of it all, a few companies were illuminating the way forward for others, and Wheelock being one of them. We all know that behind successful companies are great teams and inspiring leadership. Let's look into some ingredients of what makes leadership successful in a world where change is the only constant. So Ricky, you have been successful leading teams for many years and Wheelock is one of the largest properties developers in Hong Kong. So why are some teams outperforming the peers and what makes a successful team? Uh, one Team One Goals has been our company cultures for a really long time. Uh, everyone comes from different teams and does different kind of works, but we always work as a team with a clear common goal. We make sure everyone is doing the job with purpose. Uh, by doing things with purpose, leader can ensure all employees work with clarity and commitment and in the knowledge of not just what they are doing, but why they are doing. A key goal and purpose means a lot to, to a team. Uh, it keeps the team focused, aligned, and a mutual understanding uh, and performing with a good spirit and morale. Uh, all of this, I would say, is also create a good platform that facilitate and inspire all to brainstorm, think outside of the box, and co-create with innovation and impactful solution in mind. So purpose is the reason something gets done. When leaders begin to lead more consciously in line with purpose, they immediately begin to see the places where it's missing. And this becomes an opportunity to close the gap. 
So when we speak about opportunities, we have to speak about innovation and how disruption is placing innovation at the forefront of businesses and their success. So your company tells its employees to embrace innovation and this is something that really happens top down. How do you foster an innovative mindset within your employees? Uh, first of all, I think everyone uh, shall realize the world and the markets are constantly transforming and changing. It becomes more and more challenging uh, nowadays. Uh, we all need to be open, open to a change and always be ready for change. Uh, with a proactive uh, responsiveness, continuous learning to equip ourselves, uh, each employee, team and overall company in order to have a long-term value. Uh, this can be achieved by uh, course learning internally and externally from our business partner, from the market locally, and even all over the world. Uh, we also do a lot of R&D and co-creation to introduce new ideas and better product. Uh, to foster an innovative mindset, uh, on the other hand, we have to embrace the possibility of failure. Uh, this can encourage our employee to think big, to try and suggest bottom-up ideas and recommendations. And for each failure, which is a valuable experience and learning for each one to have a lesson and be well prepared for the next challenge, I would say. Entrepreneurship plays such an important part when we speak about failure and innovative mindset. As an example, together with Wheelock, they do recently brought together a really diverse group of people, including Wheelock employees, that co-created solutions on how to make Hong Kong's living spaces more livable as part of the Do's Green Living Challenge at WLab. The challenge was structured around the four-stage do method, an innovation method that took participants from understanding the problem to prototyping and pitching. This challenge, I think, took the real-life problem that Hong Kong is facing with, and that is also relevant to, other, to our business and participants. Together with our employees, were able to co-create relevant solutions. I can see a lot of interesting and great ideas that brought up a lot of opportunities. Through the process, our employees and other participants also learned that the skill of prototyping and the methodology, I believe, can be applied to other topics uh, and also in our company as well. Speaking of co-creation, we are currently here at WLab, where Wheelock is co-creating a happy and healthy Hong Kong together with the duo. Focused on smart cities and sustainability, we bring people together, provide them with a platform to connect, collaborate and create sustainable social impact. Why is this platform so important to Hong Kong? Uh, we want to bring innovation and entrepreneurship closer to our employees and local and global communities uh, because we live in a time where we are facing a uh, huge challenge. This includes the ways we treat the, our planet, care for our citizens and educate our youth. Uh, WLab has been an community catalyst and here at WLab, we provide a platform to develop new solutions and come together to create a sustainable future. Uh, WLab also serves as an ideal springboard for all our own employees where they can think outside of the box and test out their ideas quickly. They can collaborate and co-create by joining the challenge activities and being part of the global community of doers. Uh, this also tailored with our objective to have positive impact on the environment, PIEs, as the key strategy in sustainability. If you're interested and want to get involved, you can join our activities, whether it's in person here in Hong Kong at WLab or online. Thank you so much for your time today, Ricky, and I'm really excited on what the future holds for WLab. Really nice to hear from Ricky and Belinda as well uh, after getting the story from Anna. Um, I'm really intrigued. There were quite a few similarities, I think, between mm. the two. Also, I think some interesting differences. You started talking about the future of work, what to do as an organization for leaders and for individuals. After everything that we've heard, what do we now need to accelerate, Catherine? <laughs> Yeah, I think obviously this is, is complex and a big topic, but I think reflecting back on, on what we also just heard in terms of concrete examples and, and those inside stories, I think for me it's 
three major things. It would definitely come back to purpose. Ricky talked about that as well just now and really how to harness the, the opportunity that purpose, aligning purpose has in times of constant change to really be able to take people along and give everybody orientation. The second piece that I think really needs acceleration is, is one of the things that, that Anna spoke to, but also Ricky actually, um, and, and that's something I realized from our work as well as trust. Mm -hmm. We need to really accelerate trust-based cultures so that we offer an opportunity to learn and to grow and do that really in a way that it's it's company culture, it's the standard, it's happening. And that again gives them a base for being able to deal with a lot of uncertainty. And I think that's that's the basis of change, right? It's uncertainty and that always makes us nervous. So if we have good ways of dealing with one another, building that trust and knowing that uh, dealing with that uncertainty is actually nothing to fear, but we can learn from it and we can make it better. Uh, I think that that's the second key part. Um, and then the, the third one underlying is uh, it comes back to the fact that we know that change will keep happening. We know that we will need to transform organizations. We know that, uh, you know, actually looking into, into the big uh, aspects of climate change, uh, economic upheaval and, and other pieces. We know that that all will have more and more impact on our lives in the next coming years and lead to changes that we need to react to. So embracing that change, understanding that we can have, that we are all part of uh, you know, shaping that future and we can really within our circle of influence make a difference and to really step up and, and make that difference. Uh, because if we all do our share, I think then together we can, we can actually achieve a lot and accelerate the impact that we need to do. So those are my key points from the talks. Perfect. And then I'll turn that into an in invitation for those who haven't yet and want to increase uh, their sphere of influence and join others to create that change. Join us on the Do community, go to our website, follow the links, uh, connect, build trustful relationships with people who are very driven by purpose to pick up on some of your themes. Uh, we hope to see many of you there. And thanks a lot for joining us today for this lunch session. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.